Hello, welcome back to, this is Bruckner Oncology's first video interview. We'll, we're going to be introducing a series of these video interviews over the next three months, and then we'll see where the content schedule takes us as far as what you guys and gals in the, from the community want to know. So we're lucky, we're very lucky to have Dr. Bruckner willing to share his thoughts on oncology in general and clinical research um, and then we're going to focus on content that could be interesting for patients families of patients other physicians who may not be too familiar with clinical research um, I, do you know the percentage of physicians that uh, actually participate in clinical research compared to all physicians in general i think it's a very low number I have no clue. I would have thought uh, that the oncology community should have a higher percent because there's so many trials and people trying to enroll uh, in trials and there's so many unsatisfy unsatisfying answers yes. out there. So people, you know, are looking looking to trials, including the doctors. People, you know, want the newest and the best. Uh, and, uh, you know, partly everyone is chasing the magic bullet, but also uh, there's real, real gains in research. And uh, with selection, it, it pays the doctor and the patient. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. Bruckner, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you get started as a physician? And then why did you choose oncology? Um, let's start with that, and then we'll get into the research aspects of your career. Okay. Um, I, I was always uh, more oriented to the research side. I sort of grew up with uh, Banting and Best and all those books uh, way back when that described uh, introduction of different uh, medical modalities and uh, from way before the earliest memory uh, I was reading a, a little book on European plays, earliest plays and the one that struck me the most was one called Dr. Mandragola's Garden. And the point is that in the Middle Ages, doctors were their own pharmacists and grew their own medications. It was the, the herbs were everything. And I was very interested, not just in the herbs as therapy, but the concept that they were also toxins. So I was, from the beginning, I was struck with the concept that uh, that good medicine is also bad medicine. And I was very interested in the safety issue, side effects, and how to take something that was both good and bad and get the best out of it. Now, I didn't realize at the time, but that is such a natural fit mm -hmm. more for oncology than anything else because of the nature of the first generation oncology drugs. Now, what, what do you think about alternative therapies? You, you have all these proponents of non-traditional cancer treatments, and I just want to get your opinion on that, being somebody who's involved in on both the private practice side and clinical research, and by the way, non-academic clinical research, at least right now, I'm sure you've done yeah. academic research. Yeah, I had 150 papers <laughs> when I was a professor at Sinai, Yeah, and uh, I did uh, all the big national groups. I was working with for years. Okay. So what do you think? So, 
I, I've always uh, tried to be a little tolerant and open-minded about um, alternatives. I know that some of them have preclinical data. People have done something that could pass for formal uh, preclinical research, mainly uh, tumor cells, cell lines. Uh, so some of these things have, um, uh, you know, the first step that says you should at maybe look at them a little more. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, uh, you know, so I've always been a, a little bit on the tolerant side and wanted to hear what they were saying, what they were posing. But key, I've always told people, don't go alternative if there is something really good mm. that's out there mm -hmm. of a standard nature. And uh, don't assume that something is harmless just because it's a plant, you know, Go back to the story right. of the garden. Uh, everything in biology, practically, should be thought of as being two-sided. Yin, yang, whatever terminology <laughs> one likes. And um, so, you know, you have to treat the most innocuous thing with respect uh, and not make assumptions. So my first threshold is I don't like alternative medicine when there is a potentially curative standard treatment and I don't like it in the setting where someone is trying to validate a research drug. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair to the drug the sponsors or the patient to be uh, doing unknowns simultaneously <clears throat> with the drug that one is trying to characterize mm -hmm. because it may skew the uh, conclusion. But once you're getting into the area of uh, more palliative uh, treatments, even good palliative treatments, I'm more flexible. Uh, I like to rely on on the best uh, standards, but I'm open to a degree. Uh, now, we know that there are some that you can immediately identify that you don't want them because they don't make sense in terms of chemistry. Mm -hmm. So for me, the alternative drugs have to meet certain safety criteria. They have to meet pharmacologic bioavailability. So some of them you can screen out. Some of them are uh, oxidation or reduction protection agents. And those we know it's like personalized medicine. The alternative medicine, each one personalized, which chemo are they likely to be safe with? For example, we've just done a big vitamin C study, FDA approved vitamin C. Uh, it turns out that low doses may even be bad, as we again found in the lab. But high dose uh, knocks off all kinds of cell lines. Mm. But n but some exactly the opposite. It interferes with drugs. So you have to know which disease and which drug. And we've done this, and we find it's a very good protective agent with certain drugs. Others are not studied, and we did a formal trial. Mm -hmm. So uh, that met our criteria. 
there was lab data, there was a lab test that you could do in actual human tumors. And so, so we, we looked at it and it was helpful. Again, there are people who shouldn't get it. So, you know, my answer is alternatives. I'm open, but uh, you have to be very selective and really know about them. Uh, some of them, for example, like turmeric, there are six different brands on the market. There are only one or two that actually have a bioavailable active product. If you go in the lab, which is something I'd like to do, anytime I pick up a new thread of treatment, I like to go and test it in my lab and see what it actually does or doesn't do. That's my approach. So I was discussing with Dr. Hoffman uh, yesterday, actually, and we were talking about the lack of patient participation in clinical research. And one of the reasons, I mean, not just oncology, but every therapeutic indication could benefit by having more physicians involved in clinical research. So why do you think that we do not have more oncologists participating in clinical research or uh, even understanding what clinical research is? I'm afraid I'm a little bit uh, cynical on the subject. <laughs> Good. Since I was, I, was in, I was in it, you know, practically from the onset. And I was a very, very, note the past tense, I was a very strong proponent of, uh, of clinical research, actually helped write some of the first protocols that are still being used as the framework and criteria for evaluating drugs. So I'm very strong. But what's happened is the world has changed. Research has, has a place. It's when, when you either have something new that is clearly in the patient's interest to try, um, or when there's really nothing at all. Mm -hmm. These days, um, you know, while things like immunotherapy are clearly in the patient's interest to try, it's very important to position it right. These days, patients have a lot of very strong palliative options, but they, sh and I think people are over relying on them. You know, people are not uh, explaining properly, ideally, I don't want to use the word properly. Mm -hmm. We need to educate people in a better way as to what is the moment and which is the right uh, research offered. I have people coming in all the time, sometimes with printouts, you know, college education, people who have relatives at pharmaceutical firms on the technical side. And you they have 10 things that are being offered, not one. They have, and, and doctors are telling them, well, you pick, you pick the one. It's your consent, you make the decision. And the patient says, what are you doing? I can't pick between these, Give, help me. And these days, I, as far as I can see, it may be a skewed experience, but doctors aren't helping people pick among the choices. Okay. Now, in future interviews, um... they're laid out, help yourself. And that's wrong. We're not helping and explaining the pros and cons. We're not positioning what is the right moment to introduce the research. Mm -hmm. People are waiting too long 
to use the research option and and some are being offered the research too early when there are reasonable other things to do and then they're soured because they didn't like being something that basically they thought was being sold a bill of goods. Mm -hmm. Uh, That may may have been with good intention, but uh, if you don't present it at the moment that it makes sense, that person is turned off for research in the future. And, you know, they think that their original research source is going to be disappointing again, and they don't know there are other research sources that may give them better insights and give them a better balanced reason or a better option. Mm-hmm. Now but it's it's education, it's timing, and uh, unfortunately, everything is economics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that At is one level. You know, I'd like to think of it nicely, not paranoid, uh, you know, it's the money. That's not what I'm saying. But it's more, you know, Chicago, <clears throat> Chicago School of Economics. Every whole decision is driven by pros and cons. And when, um, and money gets into the balance travel gets into the balance is that the cancer center are you going to be the doctor are you going to let someone else be the doctor Uh, these things subtly but in a very real way impact people don't want to leave the nice doctor they become attached and sometimes dependent on, but the, but they have to leave them to get the research, so that research is lost to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So availability in a in a um, globally friendly environment. That's not the way it's done in a lot of places. I. I never personally had problem getting people into studies because my rule is I would never take on a trial unless it was at a point of maturity that I really thought there was something that could benefit the patient. Right. Uh, My, you know, I have no problem people who work for drug companies that has to be done but my personal preference is I'd like to work with the drug companies at the point where the benefit to the patient is easy to explain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, as we wrap up and in future video interviews, we're going to get into um, immunotherapy and different kinds of treatment options. And so... As we end this interview, what are you most, what are you, Dr. Bruckner, most excited about right now in um, cancer research? I'd say two things. Everyone knows that uh, things are coming up in immunotherapy. I was actually an immunologist before I was in oncology. Okay. So I. I was doing immunology papers way back when, before all these really useful new things were on the table. So um, the immunotherapy is certainly a very important area. The other area that is uh, more niche with me is I'm interested in reversing drug resistance using lab tests and lab information to pick the right drugs for the patient. And 
I have been working on the criteria for personalized medicine for close to 30 years now. Wow. And while most people from the beginning said which drug is most potent in killing cancer cells, I've my interest has been changing the criteria. I think which is the safest drug among the potential winners? Which is the drug that best integrates? I don't want to fight with the standard. I want to improve the standard. So I'm big on safety, on integration, and where other people look for one drug, I'm interested in can we find pairs of drugs that reverse resistance, mm -hmm. not only potency, and four that work at lower doses. So I'm my interest is lower doses and safety in personalized medicine, mm -hmm. which is a, a niche within the, the bigger area, personalized medicine, the use of tumor tests. So those are the two bottom line, mm -hmm. immunology and tumor testing, but more sophisticated third generation. Yes, and those both of those topics will be two separate interviews. Just wanted to get a preview for everyone watching. BrucknerOncology.com, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the MZB Cancer Research Foundation. But that will be all for another time. And right now, I do want to thank you, Dr. Bruckner, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you to everyone who's watching. Thank you.